Well, John, please tell us a little bit about your background. You are a neuroscientist. Yeah, so I was actually uh, started as a chemical engineer. And here, I have some slides that I can walk us through. Sure. Uh, so right now I have three different jobs. I'm the VP of R&D for MIVI Neuroscience. It's a small company based in Minneapolis. Uh, I am in Southern Orange County though. Uh, previously I worked for uh, Medtronic Neurovascular. Uh, I have a nice little space in the Cove, uh, which I call MIVI Pacific and uh, work with the UCI intern group there to uh, help develop some products. Uh, I also teach a course at UCI on medical device development, and uh, I look forward to doing that again in April. It's a master's of engineering course, and uh, yeah, the students have been great thus far. Nice. And I also have a consulting company that I started just about a year ago. I was uh, waiting in the uh, Montpellier Hospital in the south of France for a physician that stood me up, and I was like, well, I have some time. I'm going to start my consulting LLC and... Uh, have a, a couple of clients that I work with on some cool projects. So, so not much of a social life then. Uh, I also have a child that's turning 13 tomorrow. Uh, they they definitely keep me busy and uh, some uh, a lot of mountain biking. Okay. So, nice. Well, welcome. Yeah. Uh, actually, before you begin, I'm curious, of these clients that you have independently, what are they all in the vascular space? What Without divulging too much, what kind of projects do people sure. find you for? Uh, yeah, so Galaxy Therapeutics is a uh, aneurysm occlusion device. Um, Synchron is actually an implantable stentrode that is looking to, you know, uh, it places a stent in the uh, venous sinus. And from there, they can actually get sig signals and patients can text and hopefully more as the uh, technology continues to develop. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Are you part of uh, Daniel Kraft's universe? Uh, that name's not familiar to me, but uh, I say that one of the reasons I never went into marketing or sales is I'm horrible with names. I see. Well, I'll, I'll leave it at that then. Please continue. Uh, and then Convex uh, Medical is uh, uh, one of uh, Stan Rose companies. So a vascular company. If there's anyone who's still an attendee and <clears throat> wants to be, <clears throat> pardon me, elevated to panels, just type a note and I'll do it. I saw some folks were unable to join the screen. All right. Um, so I had some really great mentors over my life and uh, one of them told me I should develop a, a life goal. And so, you know, I always wanted to save millions of lives, but, you know, as I grow a little bit more mature, that beneficial environment is, is really important. Um, most of my career has been all in the vascular space, uh, some tissue engineering as well. And so then these are kind of the areas of expertise and we'll, we'll dive into these a little bit more. Uh, so with that life purpose, I developed this kind of wheel of what my environment is. You know, my my work is a very large bubble here, uh, but then also my family, my health, and then the community, which is one of the reasons that I started teaching at UCI is it was a good way to get involved with the local community and, and give back. So as I mentioned, I started as a chemical engineer. Uh, oh. I was actually uh, measuring pipes as they wore for my internship. Um, I didn't want to get blown up at work, so I joined uh, Cordis uh, when I graduated in uh, 2000. Actually, 99, I guess. Did you know, uh, did you work with Homer or no? <laughs> <laughs> no, he was at a different uh, plant. So okay. there, uh, <laughs> this was in uh, just outside of Tampa. So there were some alligators that would wander around the plant. Uh, it was in uh, manatees at another one of ours. So it was an interesting environment, but not somewhere I wanted to stay. Um, after working for Cordis for seven years, I actually went back for a PhD in tissue engineering, and I got to support patients in the hospital that had heart failure and had ventricular cyst devices implanted. So that was a really unique experience, being able to work overnight in hospitals and supporting surgeries and getting to know the patients. Um, you know, sometimes the devices worked quite well and patients would recover. Uh, a lot of times they were so far gone that uh, they progressed 
And, you know, it just gave me a real passion to develop better devices. And uh, October 29th was stroke awareness. And I liked this little um, video of, from a stroke survivor. And so I'll play a little bit of that. Let me know if you can hear it. Yes. So face, arm, speech, and then time to get to hospital are the signs. Driving to work, I had a bruise on my neck that I felt. I didn't see it, and I, I rubbed it. And after I rubbed it, about five seconds later, I felt like I was going to pass out. I was talking to myself, and I was like, what's going on? As I was driving, I couldn't see out of my left eye. I was driving along the center divide a couple times. Let's see if this one works a little bit better. And I tell him that I'm there to see Stefan and he had had a stroke. She comes back and says, okay, they're ready for you. And just so you know, there's eight doctors. They had given us three choices. The last one was to do an embolectomy, go up through his groin and All right. pull the clot out. I thought, well, we're going to well, go with that one because that just seems. Of course, this worked all perfectly last night, but we'll, well see. You know, okay. Why don't you, um, I'll, I'll uh, it's on YouTube, it seems. I'll look up this story and I'll put the link in the chat for folks sounds good so um this is nice can i sit so stefan had a, that a came and, and, and now he went out um and you know actually woke up started using his arm that was paralyzed beforehand uh they pulled out the clot that you can see here and he returned to work and made a full recovery Okay, we can stop with that. And there's the link for folks. Uh, you'll want to copy and paste it somewhere and you can watch it later. Right. I wanted to ask a question. Did that clot come out of his brain or the carotid artery? Uh, the brain. So oh, most of the uh, strokes are in the middle cerebral artery. So it is uh, right uh, there in the picture behind my head. Uh, so this is actually where the clot is. This is the internal carotid artery. And then that's the middle cerebral artery. Uh, so about 90% of strokes happen in that region. And then, you know, it affects one side of the brain or the other. So then the, the symptoms are uh, opposite of that. All right. Oops. So uh, this was a um, methodology that was used by Earl Bakken. Uh, who was the, the founder of Medtronic. He started it in his garage with a physician. Uh, Earl's uh, portable pacemaker went from concept to patient in six weeks. Uh, I don't think I'll ever beat that timeline. So, but with that, you know, I, I like the methodology and really have broken this down into, you know, risk burn down, then feedback and adjusting. Uh, I think a lot of times, you know, companies, especially large companies, end up debating things for so long that they miss their advantage. Um, so, you know, I think taking that first step once you're ready is important. So with that, uh, you know, making sure everybody is on the same page is really important. This equation to the right is, is one of my favorites. Uh, it's the number of communication channels. So it's an exponential. And you can see that with 50 people that you have to communicate with, there's 1,225 communication channels. Can anybody guess how many communication channels there are with 1,001 people? Did it go with a lot? Yeah, it, it's uh, 4,999 and 999. So we'll, we'll round up for uh, sake. Uh, it's half a million people with 1,001 people. So, you know, this is where communication is really important. Uh, also, why working in a small company is quite nice is I went from 300 emails a day to about 30. So I can spend more time on things that uh, matter. 
So one of the things I did when I uh, joined the small company was implement this high performance management system. So Louis Ballone was a previous coworker of mine uh, and really helped us structure the company so that it had focus. Um, with the system, it was actually used by EB3, uh, which became COVID and Medtronic. And so I had experience with it, but it comes down to focusing on a vital few, right? Making sure that everybody is aware of what are the most important things to the company. And then through these stoplight reports, tracking them uh, on a weekly basis. And if something happens, you know, it's very clear and everybody just jumps on it and can help solve the problem. Uh, it's been very useful in the, the company that I've been with, and I think we've done a very nice job of implementing it and maintaining that focus. Uh, limited funds also help us maintain that focus because we can only do a couple of projects, but hopefully we solve that soon. And then this is one of my other favorite uh, little uh, videos. I don't know. Let's see if this one works better. Herding cats. Don't let anybody tell you it's easy. Anybody can herd cattle. Holding together 10,000 half wild short hairs. Oh, that's another thing altogether. This was a Super Bowl commercial, I remember. Yes, yes. So I, uh, I refer to a project manager. Being a cat herder is probably about herding cats, but... Um... Program management is like herding cats while spinning plates. That you have to keep everything going, and if one plate falls, you know the whole herd scatters. So uh, I thought it was a quite funny little commercial and uh, a good way to describe project management. Uh, the other thing I use a lot with project management, and I am a project management professional as well, uh, or I, like I uh, say, I'm a doctor pimp or a pimp doctor, one way or another. Uh, so with risk burn down, a lot of people use this for products, but I like using it for projects. You know, what are those highest risks that are going to kill a project or an idea? And how do you burn those down as quickly as possible, as cheaply as possible? The, uh, the more functional way to look at this is uh, I like referring to this as my mountain biking experience. Right? Uh, this was me at Vail Lake last weekend. And you know you can see the full face helmet as well as the uh, the body gear. Uh, it was the first time I was riding out there, so I was taking some extra precautions uh, to make sure that you know that consequence was uh, as minimal as possible, even though the likelihood was higher with uh, riding unfamiliar trails. So. And then in terms of developing and improving devices, I really love the MOD database. It's a great resource uh, to look at, to figure out what's going on with existing devices, what are the issues, how they can be improved. And then they also deal a lot with the complications from the patient side. And so this is how one of the projects I started and worked on for 11 years, uh, it was targeting thrombosis. And this was the major problem with intracranial stents, as well as flow diverters, which are an, another branch to uh, cure aneurysms. I see the word mod there, and I'm compelled to tell you that one of our group members works on a software platform that means you never have to use mod again. Yes, it is not the most friendly database. There's well, a ton of... That is the euphemism for the most painful database. So if you are interested <laughs> in that, I can get you in touch with him. And so, you know, you can look at this by manufacturer if you, you know, download these CSV files, but there's a, a lot of data there and it's not the most useful as Joe just mentioned. Uh, but it is very interesting that you can go into each individual case and see the complications and read about it. Uh, so it is a great learning tool. And so then, you know, I like to look at things in a structured manner. And this is a uh, article that I'm working on with a couple other physicians around flow diversion. And on the left-hand side, you can see all of the inputs that I as an engineer can change. And on the top is all of the outputs that the physician care about. And so we're doing this as a primer just to let physicians know what all the different parameters are and how they affect each other. And there really is no perfect 
you know, flow diverter. You know, flow diverter is much like a stent, but it is 30% metal coverage instead of, you know, about 6%. And so it actually acts as a scaffold to heal the aneurysm uh, as well as slow the flow. And then the project I was mentioning was actually looking at a surface modification to lower the thrombogenicity. And this is one of the projects I'm most proud of. It took uh, 11 years to get to the US market. I uh, attended the first case at uh, NYU, and then I left Medtronic uh, two months later. So it was a nice conclusion of my career there. But with thrombosis, there's a lot of things that affect it. And I was really looking at the device material and with that, you know, we ended up with a large battery of tests that we did and publications from that with internal as well as uh, with our physician consultants. Uh, this is one of the things I like best about neurovascular is it's a small community and I get to work with these physicians quite closely. Uh, and, you know, we've become friends with many of them over the years. So this was from one of the, the publications we looked at uh, thrombogenicity without blood flow. And then we actually had a, um, a human blood flow lab within uh, Medtronic. So we had Medtronic volunteers give their fresh blood, and then we could actually test devices. So, you know, we actually gave our blood sweat, and uh, hopefully there weren't any tears on the project. But it was really cool to, you know, see the effect and test it out multiple different ways. And uh, this has actually became the standard for other flow diverters to test with. So it's kind of nice that the methods have been copied and still hold up. John, what, what is, uh, I don't know if you pronounce it, MIVI or MIVI neurosciences focus? Yeah. Are we seeing some of that in your presentation or is this more of your consulting work or research and background? Yeah. So uh, MIVI has two products. One is the Q catheter and the other one is the daisy thrombectomy device. So the daisy thrombectomy device helps with uh, ischemic stroke. It sits distal clot so that as you're pulling out the clot, you can get all of the clot um, and no fragments go distally. So it really helps to stabilize the clot. Uh, the Q catheter is an extension catheter. So if you're familiar with coronary or carotid procedures, it's basically a catheter on a stick or extension wire. And this just gives us much better aspiration flow uh, versus standard catheter. So our proximal end is much larger at 90 thousandths or 2.3 versus standard catheter. Uh, this matters even more as you go more distally that our catheters are tapered. So, you know, getting to these small vessels, we have more aspiration power. And this is what it looks like. So this is one of our experimental setups where we have synthetic clot in a tube. Here's the Q4, the MIVI catheter versus a competitive catheter. And once we turn on aspiration, the clot is ingested into the Q catheter very quickly. And, you know, the competitive catheter makes some progress, but it's very slow. And so at the end of three minutes, which no physician really waits that long. You know, more than 50% of the clot is still outside the catheter. So you can imagine as they pull that back, then part of the clot is going to break off. Um, so not the best outcome. And so kind of that's the, the wrap up of uh, everything I, I had, uh, you know, I think Having a, a balance is uh, very important. Uh, I'm happy that you know, between the startup and my consulting career, I, I now have more of a balance than I did. Uh, and I look forward to developing you know, more life-saving devices. That's one of the reasons I like consulting is I can help people get more devices to market. And uh, you know, it makes it fun and interesting and intriguing. Tiger, I have to ask, you sent a message to everyone. One pizza rule. I don't know what that means. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Amazon, you were talking about the, the size of teams earlier. Uh -huh. So Amazon has a, uh, a famous rule that no team can uh, be larger than it requires to eat one pizza. And so, it, you know, they try to keep the problem solving down to about, you know, three or four or five people. 
Oh, everyone gets two slices? Everybody gets two slices, yeah. And I'm sure they could reorder if it's a all day <laughs> event. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, as you work on larger teams, then you have to have a couple key stakeholders that represent the larger group. Uh, that way you can keep it to a, a reasonable discussion. That's yeah. not always the easiest to do that. You know, everybody wants to be involved in the, the important discussions, but it doesn't make it very useful. Yeah. I like well, on uh, Grady. It's good to see him. I've never seen him with a goatee and um, he doesn't make many calls. I'm curious, Grady, why you cleared your calendar for this one. Is there something that you're working on in the vascular space right now that made this particularly relevant for you and you want to take yourself off mute? If you can, there you go. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, sorry. Uh, it's a combination of very rarely having uh, free time at 10 o'clock on uh, Friday on the central time. Um, and this is 10 o'clock on a Friday morning and it's rare that I have uh, an opening, but I am uh, actively involved in the in the dementia uh, cognitive impairment space, and I was just curious uh, how some of the things that he's doing might impact that uh, that side of things. John, yeah, there uh, there is interesting work being done on drug delivery, um, and so I have one colleague that's working on. Um, hereditary diseases, but delivering drugs directly to the, the CSF. Um, and so there might be some interesting pathways there that bypass the blood brain barrier. Um, so that continues to be a area of investigation, not one that I'm working on currently, but uh, definitely some nice possibilities if you can get past the, the blood brain barrier. Marvin, you're a former uh, physio person. Um, did some of the stuff that John talked about touch on the world that from whence you came? Um, not too much, really, because most of what we did was external. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we didn't really have any stroke treatments, which is unfortunate. Uh, and more and more companies are looking at post stroke treatments, and you know, if there's additional benefits that can be made. Uh, there is quite a large bit of, you lose about uh, 1.9 million neurons per minute when you have a stroke. And so getting to the hospital quickly and getting treatment is the best way. But then, you know, there is salvageable uh, penumbra or the area outside that, you know, dead tissue and figuring out ways to, you know, help that remodel in a positive sense. And okay. a lot of I guess there. So I guess there was one product we were looking at a cooling product, like a cooling product to help extend the time that you had to respond to the stroke. Yeah, and right there's a large inflammatory process afterwards because you have all this necrotic tissue at the core of the stroke, and so you know cooling can help there as well. Doctor Sue prefers to type versus speak, but I always coax her to take her microphone. Yeah, I, I believe there's a 90 minute window and also there's hypo. I think they do hypothermic protocol for a 24 hour. You cool them for uh, 24 hours and then you warm them for 24 hours. We would make, I'm, I'm a pharmacist um, working in the hospital as a clinical hospital pharmacist and we would make, you know, saline bags and put them in the freezer at a certain temperature. Everything had to be regimented and they'd have certain drugs for shivers and um, you I forget what the drug was. Um, anyhow, uh, um, but there's a 90 minute window. And if you don't meet that criteria, then then your chances of, of coming back for a full recovery diminish every minute that goes by after that. Yeah. And so the, the uh, as Sue mentioned, you know, getting that care as quickly as possible is the most critical thing for the, the drugs. It's a four hour maximum, but they're much more effective in that 90 minute window. Um, and then clots can be pulled out up to 24 hours, but you're still losing that 1.9 million neurons per minute. So if you don't have good collateral flow, uh, it, it becomes a diminishing return. So you know, getting to the right hospital, you know, Mission or Hogue all have thrombectomy um, and they can get you treated fast. You have to get to the right hospital that has those uh, the regimens in place. 
It, exactly. Uh, only about 10% of hospitals can actually do a mechanical thrombectomy where they pull the clot out. Uh, there's probably about you know 40% of hospitals can give the the drug to help break up the clot, um, but you know the drug is only effective about 30% of the time. Eddie is our resident anesthesiologist. Um, I'm sure Ed, in your time, you've had a number of folks in for uh, brain surgery and the like. I'm curious if you heard something today that was new. Um, well, I was certainly impressed by the losing a million neurons per minute. Uh, I didn't think I even had that many <laughs> myself. But uh, yeah, it, it uh, certainly reinforces the importance of reestablishing flow. Um, and another aspect that we don't often think about is um, during uh, coronary stent placement. You are placing a stent because there is significant occlusion to the lumen. And yet when you pass the catheter there, you're further occluding it. And at the time of putting the stent, but you know, placing it in the right place and expanding and so on uh, with a balloon, you, you actually transiently shut off the blood flow to that portion of the heart. And it really um, is important to maximize the margin of safety uh, that, that um, uh, one can have. And, you know, even as the stent is expanded as well, then particles can be shed much like a carotid disease. You know, all carotid devices have some sort of distal or proximal protection, but, you know, you move 10 inches either way, there, there is no protection. And so, you know, that's where that DAISY device that MIVI is, is developing is, should be useful is, you know, making sure that there isn't a shower of particles distal. Does that product have many competitors? Nikki, I'm curious if, I mean, undoubtedly back at your Intermountain days, you had to give the thumbs up or down on reimbursing devices like that one. Uh, yeah. So there's a lot of I... thrombectomy devices, but not one like DAISY. <clears throat> Please go ahead. The, the Intermountain, I don't know. I don't remember doing anything in neurovascular. Um, I just got back yesterday from the Viva conference in Las Vegas, which is the vascular surgery, vascular intervention meeting. So all things thrombectomy and thrombolysis is what I do for a living on that computer. Um, <laughs> and anything having to do with reimbursement, health economics, um, make sure that the dollars and cents make sense for anything in thrombectomy or or thrombolysis but i always say I, I work below the collarbones and outside of the heart so peripheral intervention uh, if you got in your leg that's a deep vein thrombosis that clot breaks loose runs up into your lungs now you got a pulmonary embolism so boston scientific and a number of companies have products that can either go in and pull out that, that blood to your leg or thrombolyse that, that clot out of your leg before they get to your lung. If they do get to your lung, they have similar products for pulmonary embolism. Um, but John, yeah, it, it's the same, whether the, whether the blood clots here in your leg, here in your arm, here in your head, it's all about getting that clot out, whether you thrombect it or you thrombolyse it. And I know in the peripheral world, there's, and I, I describe it as a street fight. And you see it at conferences like Viva at the Wynn Hotel I was just at for the last four days. I mean, you have strong opinions. For all the published literature, there is a camp that says you thrombect, you thrombect, you thrombect. And there's another camp that says, no, you thrombolyse, you thrombolyse, you thrombolyse. And so people like John have to have to fall into that somewhere and try to convert the thrombolysing people to thrombectomy. Now, I don't know in neuro, John, maybe there's some really strong guidelines from the American Academy of Neurovascular Intervention or something that say, now nah, that, 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 that happens in the peripheral world. Here in the neurovascular world, there's no debate. You thrombect, you know. But if it is wishy-washy, you, you have to solve that. And then you have to keep an eye on what's Medicare doing. Is Medicare moving payments away from a certain technology to a different one? 
they just came out with their new payments yesterday, I think. I'm just turning on my work computer. Um, so that, that's something to keep in, in mind is, you know, Medicare changes their payment policies year over year. And maybe that shifts from the thrombecting world. And now people go, ah, thrombolysing sounds pretty good. And you go, oh, good grief. Is it? Is that the right thing to do? Or is that just because payment mechanisms are changing, now a certain intervention is more favorable? Yeah. And so I think there's always that leading edge of treatment and, you know, the, the data tends to, to follow a couple of years behind. So in 2016, there was five publications that showed the benefit of thrombectomy, and it was basically a 20% benefit in patient recovery. So that debate ended very quickly about thrombolysis versus thrombectomy, but it took over 10 years to get there. Um, and it, so, you know, it was a painful journey. Um, and now you know, there's five trials ongoing looking at these smaller vessels and seeing if there's a benefit there, which a lot of physicians are already treating because these are eloquent areas. You know, it's a small vessel that um, perfuses your Broca area, which is what's responsible for speech. So if you couldn't speak for the rest of your life, you would say, please, no, you know, go get that little clot. It, it's a very important part of the brain I'd like to keep. Um, and so, you know, I, evidence eventually gets there, but it, it always lags. And, you know, we just don't have the patience that cardiovascular does. Uh, there's, uh, you know, there's 800,000 strokes in the U.S. every year, but, uh, you know, only about uh, 40,000 of those are actually treated. And not all of those are large vessels. So, you know, we're about 14% of patients that could be treated are treated currently. And John, does your product have distal embolic protection? Do you need it? Yeah, and so that's where the product is is unique, that DAISY product that it, it really, it started as a carotid filter and, you know, we've moved it distally to neurovascular. Um, and it will be cleared as part of a thrombectomy system. Um, okay. We we don't want to qualify it as a filter uh, because there is no reimbursement for that. So it will be part of a system that will just okay. hopefully give better uh, angiographic and uh, patient outcomes. But uh, you know, reimbursement is definitely a challenge, especially for new devices that don't have predicates. Yeah. Nick yeah, this works about as many hours as you do. So if you need a consultant, he uh, he routinely forsakes his six children and wife and <laughs> and goes hangs out in Vegas. Yeah, yeah that's right. Michelle, you that's right. are yeah. in a related space in DVT. Um, you had a comment. Off oh, mute, please. There in the corner where you're, there's the little microphone button. There you go. There you okay. Go. Sorry about that. Uh, yes. Um, thank you for inviting me onto the panelist. Um, you know, it's very impressive what John is doing and helping people. And that's really one of my patient, patient uh, passions as well. Um, I have been working on a DVT device with a manufacturer in Taiwan. And um, they have been shipped this particular system to Australia, Singapore, and I believe Belgium, and now it's under evaluation in the UK. Um, working with this device, I have a lot of questions because what I learned is those uh, DVT devices, more of preventive uh, systems that once a patient develops DVT, then you can really use those products. But with John's device, if the blood clot was removed, can the patient go back and utilize the device to prevent the next occurrence? I think that's my question. Yeah, reoccurrences is, is often an issue with peripheral artery disease. You know, a lot of times the patients are diabetic and you know, diabetes just leads to all sort of host of complications uh, throughout, I think, every organ system. Um, and so, you know, prevention is definitely the best thing. You know, by the time the patient already has these problems, it's it's much more difficult to treat. Um, you know, I think this is why there's so much work being done. Uh, I joined a, a study out of Columbia looking at, you know, exercise breaks every, uh, the original research was five minutes every 30, and it could just be walking around. 
Um, but they were expanding that time window because it, it didn't seem realistic to take a break every five minutes or five minutes every 30. Uh, I, I actually now have a uh, stepper at my standing desk so I can get in some movement uh, because uh, I'd rather stay in good health as long as possible. And then uh, local companies like Inari are working, uh, have grown quite rapidly in treatment of peripheral artery disease. Uh, the, the VP of R&D there uh, used to work with me at, in neurovascular and, you know, very similar type treatments, just, uh, you know, scaling things much larger, slightly different clot. Uh, the clot a lot of times is much more mature and harder to get out. Thank you. Um, and then I, I do see one of the, the questions in the chat. Oh, about the I'm going to get to Rick, uh, okay. but Michelle, the, um, the device uh, you're working on, you did not mention the U.S. Are they looking to bring it into the States? Are, are you, where are you based, Michelle? Um, I live in a uh, Space Coast area in Florida. Um, I work with this company, uh, this is a, a medical device manufactured. Um, they ship products to U.S. to basically all over the world. Um, so for this particular device, uh, it it was 510K clear in 2019. Um, yes, they do want to bring it into the U.S., but due to reimbursement and and I believe right now in the U.S., uh, COVID and all kind of health now, uh, their SCD unit is widely utilized and also some place use Agile's Flowtron ACS 900. So this product, you know, well, I'm, I'm kind of like trying to commercialize the product and then the product is as good as others, but it's not known in the US. So it's hard to uh, bring it into the US market. Mm -hmm. So if anybody on the panel can help, then that would be great. Well, I think uh, Nick would be your first visit, but um, I'm uninspired by it's as good as the others, because if it's as good as the others, what's the point of switching? So I, I can't help if it's in the DVTPE space because of conflicts oh. of interest. Okay. But, um, but you know, yeah, a guy. sorry, Michelle. I, I, I okay. probably know a guy, yeah. but I can't, I personally can't do anything. It's too, too close to what I do. Fair enough. Okay. Mr. Stockton. Oh, I just, um, even if I'd been doing something else, John, I'd want to tune into this anyway, because uh, everything I hear from the neuroscience end is, it just illuminates and changes the way I think. And so I thought I'd ask you, in your study of neuroscience, how has that changed your outlook on uh, the world in general? And how does it change your, how, is it, how have you seen it change your approaches to projects and challenges and problems. Yeah, I think the you know number one thing is just how fragile life is, right? You know, we go about our daily lives, and you know, one little change, and uh, it can make drastic uh, impacts. And you know, how temporary things are. Uh, I, I definitely think that's one of the reasons I am drawn towards uh, mindfulness and meditation. Uh, just not. Uh, as good of a practitioner as I would like just yet. So it's always continuous growth. Uh, I think that's the other thing is just always learning something, uh, you know, keeping our brains active. Uh, I was listening to 10% uh, Happier is one of my favorite podcasts. It, it deals a lot with mindfulness, but has a lot of scientists on it. And they were talking that, you know, Sudoku really doesn't prevent your brain from deteriorating. It's learning new things that if you just do the same thing over and over, you're not creating new pathways. And so, you know, I think that's where I'm trying to learn French because I end up uh, over there uh, frequently supporting clinical studies and for conferences. And, you know, it, language has never been easy for me, um, but trying to find those areas where, you know, pushing my brain and creating different neural connections. So, you know, I have more of them later. Hmm. This, this podcast, tell us about it. 10% uh, Happier is from uh, Dan Harris. He used to be a anchor on, I forget which news network, um, but he has a bunch of scientists and meditation experts on, uh, and you know it's a, a nice way, and there's meditations every week. He also has an app. So uh, I, it's, it's what I tend to listen to as I'm driving uh, 
my child to uh, Journey, which is 30 minutes away. So, uh, uh, And it's her birthday tomorrow. Yes, yes. Happy birthday to her. Um, well, um, if there's no one else who has something to contribute, I'll say... Uh, there was a, just a question around the mod uh, database. Well, I, I got Tiger privately on that, but you're welcome okay. to address it. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean... In the US, companies are required to report any issues within 24 hours, especially if there's patient harm. Uh, so it actually works pretty well in the US uh, if there is a patient harm. If it's a device not working, the reporting is much less. Um, physicians tend not to report. So then the companies aren't aware. So there is definitely a bias there. Thank you for that. I really appreciate, especially. Uh, that you and I have never spoken before today for you to jump on and, and spend your time with us. And uh, thanks. It's definitely for... enjoyable. And I look forward to uh, attending more in the future. Oh, you know, uh, Michelle, you uh, you asked for John's email address. John, would you either put that screen up again or just tell us? I, I have the one that you have on LinkedIn, which is your Gmail, but I suspect that's not the one you want to share. Yeah, the uh, the Wainwright Medical at gmail.com is the, the best one. I get far less... Uh, spam there so oh, it's much spelling of your last name medical all one word at gmail.com yeah exactly that's where to find him thank you everybody and i'll uh you. see you again this time next week john you're welcome to join any week at all all right sounds good and these qr codes uh one links to my cell phone and then the top one is to linkedin so appreciate it the trick i learned from joe uh, at one of his uh events oh huh. okay uh, did did you attend one that I was presenting? Uh, it was a panel meeting for uh, Avamed. Oh, oh, that's right. It, it was in uh, Anaheim. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Hmm. That's right. Now I remember. Hey, hey Joe. Uh, I just want to kind of restate my last statement that I think I shut down by you really quickly. Yes, this device is as good as others, but I think it's better because it's more economical. And um, U.S. market is really trying to get the cheapest because I work with uh, a lot of manufacturers and companies in the EU. Um, the pricing is just outrageous difference. And um, and also I'm working with some clients I'm moving from MDD to MDR. So I see all the new requirements. And so the cost of the medical device is really not only the manufacturing cost, it's all those paperwork, busy paperwork costs will be folded into the device. And um, so... I think pricing is more of the issue for for my client try to bring the product into the U.S. And um, so I, I just want to make it clear, you know, yes, their product is really good, but their pricing is much better. So I think that might be something I, I should I have it. But I just put my JH at medical devices group dot net email address there. Um, I Nikki is my go to on reimbursement, but I do have other folks that I trust if you want to reach out to me. And Sue, yes, my next call is going to be to get you more sterilization help. And I'm the packaging person if you need it. <laughs> <laughs> we we do qualified for the QMBC in Maryland. So anybody that wants to have a last chance on investing in Cartec, we give you a third of your um, money back. I can verify this. I invested with Sue uh, last year and the state of Maryland after quite a bit of paperwork and aggravation, gave me a refund in the amount of one third of my investment. So um, I'll say if, if I invested 30,000, I still have a $30,000 investment in Sue's company and I have only paid 20,000 for it. And we're uh, just like a month, and I'm just waiting on sterilization um, and then we're going to FDA. So in the next month or two, we should be- For John's benefit since he's undoubtedly rich, um, what do you do? And and uh, we'll conclude with that. Cartech is, a, is my company. We are a medical device company, and I am a pharmacist by trade that saw a problem with filtering ampule-based medication. The problem is ampules um, are sealed containers, but once you break that neck, glass shards get in there, and it's a complicated multi-needle, multi-step process. Until um, now. Pardon? Not until now. So what I've done was I relocated the filter from where it screws onto the needle to the tip and placed it over a needle and invented it all in one package, one needle filter device, um, saving glass shards from entering the patient, reducing needle stick injuries and taking half the time. 
And we are working with Becton Dickinson. We've been invited to meet with them on Monday with a team that we've been working with for the last three years via Zoom. So it'll be nice to see them in person. And you've won many grants. Um, I, a NSF grant for our third iteration. Actually, we're bringing um, a Route 3 is our company that we're working with for our blunt needle. And that'll be for Europe and, and uh, other countries. Um, European market is twice what it is in the U.S., and and India is like probably number two, China number one, India number two, um, and so we just received a PCT so we can um, go to Taiwan, Michelle, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's it's been a journey, uh, and I hope that it it comes to fruition in the next year or two. Well, it should be on the market selling by the summer of next year. This is not a recommendation, and you should check with your financial advisor before making any decision. But who wants to get rich with me and Sue? <laughs> you know, yeah, I yeah, Becton Dickinson. Dickinson. We we want we want to exit with three billion dollars. I don't know if that's realistic or not, but that's my figure right now. What does what are you valuing the company at right now? Right now, we were evaluated at seven point two million dollars, but that was last August after we met with the pre-sub with FDA. So I imagine we're probably 10 now. Once we submit to FDA, that'll double. You're saying that at you that point it'll be 20 now. million? Pardon, 20, yeah. 20 million, and you think it'll go for 3 billion? No, I think, you know, they BD just bought two other companies in cash for 1.5 billion. So why shouldn't it be me? Why not? Why not us? Am I right or am I right? Yes. Uh, hearing from my accountant. And I totally agree with meditation and breathing. Um, I've been doing it for years and, and it's kind of kept me sane through all of this. It's been a journey. I've been journaling ever since I left the real world of, of um, a paycheck. <laughs> thank you, Sue. And thank you again, John. Everyone have a great weekend and I'll see you next week. Same time. Bye now. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right.